So today we're back in the gospel according to Luke. We're looking at the parable of the rich fool. So speaking of a rich man, when I was a boy, you've heard this before, that we lived out east. Uh, when I was going into fourth grade, mom and dad moved us out to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Dad got a transfer out there, and so we lived out there for three years. And as a blessing of being out there, we were close to New York City. And so a couple times a year on average, mom and dad would take us to New York City just on a trip to do this, that, or the other thing. And on one of these particular trips, I don't remember what year it was, it really doesn't matter, mom and dad took us to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is in New York City, otherwise known as the Met. And talk about a cool museum. If you ever get the opportunity to go to New York, you got to go to the Met. But anyway, that particular year, and I don't know if mom and dad planned this or not, but King Tut's exhibit, at least part of it anyway, was on display at the Met. And talk about cool. I mean, you see stuff on TV and through specials of National Geographic, but to be able to see some of those treasures up close and personal was just what an amazing experience. One I'll never forget. Well, fast forward about a decade when I was in the Navy, when I was in the fleet, went on my very first med cruise, and we took port call in Alexandria, Egypt. We stayed there for about a week, and as part of that, you could take a tour to Cairo for $4. For $4, we got a three-hour bus ride through the desert on a nice coach bus, got a great meal from the Navy. We got to go to the Great Pyramids, we got to go to the Sphinx, and we got to go to the Egyptian Museum of Antiquity, Antiquity, which is literally about two blocks away from the pyramids. You don't ever see that on TV. And in that, the full tut display was on exhibit. And wow. I mean, it was just amazing. That treasure of tut. Today it's estimated at a value of roughly one billion dollars. That's a lot of money, wouldn't you say? Kind of on a side note from that, and it's just kind of a fun little factoid. Tut's father, King Tut's father, Akhenaten, was the first pharaoh, actually the first and the only pharaoh, who rejected his faith in the Egyptian pantheon of gods, and he started to profess a faith in one single monotheistic god. Now, here's what's even more interesting in all this. Akhenaten, Tut's father, was born and was raised at about the same exact time within a few years of when Moses was born and raised in Egypt. And as Scripture suggests, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's court. So it's possible that Moses and Akhenaten, King Tut's dad, knew one another and knew one another well. Moses probably witnessed Akhenaten's ascension to the throne and maybe even his conversion to monotheism. And maybe Moses and his people had something to do with that. I don't know. I just think that's kind of a cool little factoid. What's more, after Moses fled to Midian, he would have probably heard about Akhenaten's passing and his son Tut's ascension to the throne and then Tut's undoing of his father's religious forms, and then about his early demise himself. And like all of his fathers before him, Tut was buried with all his worthy treasures because he thought he can enjoy all those things in the afterlife, right? But to paraphrase a great theologian, the biggest tragedy isn't in what Tut left behind to the sands of time. But what laid before him? An eternity without God, the God of Moses, and maybe, just perhaps, the God that even perhaps his father Akhenaten got to know. Tut, like every Egyptian before him, believed that his heart would need to be lighter than the truest feather in order to make it into the afterlife. And in their in their faith system, they believed that covetousness, greed, made the heart heavy and unable to pass into the afterlife of paradise. Was Tut covetous? 
Was he a greedy man? By a lot of our standards, we'd probably say yeah. And in a roundabout way, Jesus kind of talked about these things, right? And he talked about how God wants us to weigh our own hearts. For you and I to see if our hearts are as light as a feather. That's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to go back to the gospel according to Luke chapter 12. What we just looked at. We're going to hear it one more time. If I can get there to the right page. Here we go. The parable of the rich fool. We're going to take it in chunks. Then someone called out from the crowd, teacher. Now, let me put a pause because I didn't do that. What's going on here is Jesus had been teaching, right? And he had amassed a crowd of about a thousand people. That's what's going on. And so from all these people that were there, someone just shouts out, right? And we hear this. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And then we hear Jesus' reply. And he said this. Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide things such as this? And then Jesus said this. It's a pretty point-blank statement. He said, beware. Guard your heart against all kinds of greed. Life isn't measured by how much you own. And then he went on to tell the story, the parable that we just heard a few minutes ago. He said, a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. And he said, I don't know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And then I'll sit back and say to myself, friend, you have enough stored away for the years to come? Now take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry. Enjoy the good life, right? You know, as Tut did, and probably as most of us do, whether we're conscious of it or not, right, we tend to measure our lives by worldly means. How much money we have in the bank, how big our house is, how many cars we have, how many toys we have, how big our property is, our stuff, right? Our 401k, our 403b, material possessions. But Jesus was pretty blunt in saying to this man in the crowd, right? He said, guard your heart against every kind of greed. So he's talking about more than just monetary greed. His life isn't measured by how much you own. And then Jesus made up the story that we just heard to illustrate his point about the dangers of measuring our lives based upon stuff, right? Based upon the stuff that we we own, about material gain. Now, we don't know if the guy in the crowd was a rich man or not. That's really besides the point. But Jesus was essentially saying to him, as the author of Hebrews later on wrote, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. In other words, Jesus was saying, man, quit trying to get rich as the world defines it. For your heavenly Father measures wealth by another standard. How would you measure wealth? If I were to ask you this, how would you measure wealth? And what might Jesus say? Here's some interesting and yet sobering facts. I should have put them up here on the screen, but I didn't. This is according to the World Bank. In 2022, the global mean income per person was about $7.60 a day. And then within that, 70% of the world's population lives on only $6.85 a day. Let's contrast that with us in the United States. The typical American, this is from those who are, have just been born all the way up to those who are ready to pass on, right? Everybody. The typical American lives off of roughly $168 a day. With food and beverage consumption taking up about roughly $23 a day. And if you start to do the math, that means that the typical American, right, just the average Jane, the average Joe, spends about 25 times more than the global mean income of most people on the earth. 
That's a lot of dough. Now, if we were to take that global mean income and just, right, just, that's all of it. But play with me here. Imagine that you only had $7.60 a day to feed yourself. Let's say you're a family of four. That's roughly $30 a day. Could you do that? Could you, could you feed yourself for $30 a day? Probably. If you just went to the grocery store, right, you could easily feed your family for like $30 a day. But in that, then you've got to forget about your housing. You've got to forget about your, your utilities, your transportation, your entertainment, your leisure, your toys, everything else. Because when we look at it, our food consumption makes up only about 15% of our budget. Your typical American eats about 15% of, of their actual budget. So now that $30 a day really isn't $30 a day for a family of four. You're talking about $5 a day for a family of four to feed yourself. Who here do you think you could eat off of $5 a day? All your meals for $5 a day. Can we do it? Here's what $5 a day gets you. You get to go to Walmart, and you get to buy a tube of cheap beef, 70-30 beef, for $3.97, and then you go over to the, the middle aisle, and you get yourself a box of great value, generic hamburger helper. And those two things together... $5.25. So now you're over your budget by a quarter. You don't get any coffee. You don't get any booze. You don't get anything like that. You're drinking tap water and eating nasty hamburger helper. And oh, by the way, it's four of you, so you only get a quarter of that box. And that's all you get for one day. Who wants to sign up for that? Anybody? No? We're all pretty silent, aren't we? I don't want that stuff either, right? You get that, right? It's a sobering thought when we consider that we, on average, here in the United States, we make about 25 times more per day than the world mean average. And in the world's eyes, we're richer than rich. Every single one of us, the average American. So when we look at this parable, right, we got to realize that Jesus is talking to us, right? He's addressing us. And I don't know about you, but who of us doesn't want more or better and even more still? Anybody honest? I am. I'd love to make more money. I'd love to have more stuff. I'd love to have me one of them nice brand new trucks over there at Trite. My budget can't afford it. If we're honest with ourselves, we're probably all at least a little bit guilty in some way, shape, or form. But God doesn't want us to measure our lives that way. He measures our lives a little bit differently. And so Jesus continued his story. And he finished by saying this. And we heard this again a few minutes ago, but it's good to hear it again. Jesus said, you fool, you're going to die this very night. Then who's going to get everything that you work so hard for? Yes, a person is fooled to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. What Jesus is really saying there is that our, the human appetite for wanting to have more and better and more still is making us dead on the inside. It's killing us. And that God is weighing our souls he even said here that your soul is required of you tonight. He said that to the man, right? In other words, Jesus is saying we're foolish if we want to have a life that has more and better and more yet still. Instead, Jesus is saying, instead of wanting that, want to have a deeper relationship with the Lord. Go deeper in your faith with the Lord. Go deeper in your devotion to the Lord. That's in God's eyes what it means to be truly rich. So the question we have to ask ourselves is really, how are we measuring our lives? I don't want you to respond by saying to God what you think he wants to hear or with the correct biblical answer. I think we should all look in the mirror and respond by taking a hard look at our actions, our behaviors, and our habits. How are we currently living? What are we doing? How would God weigh our hearts? 
Are they heavy? With all kinds of greed, right? It's not just about money in the bank or stuff. It could be greed with food. Greed with anything. Or our hearts lighter than a feather. It behooves us to ask ourselves a question. Do I honestly care more about my stuff? Or do I care more about a relationship with God? In my humble opinion, Jesus was saying this to us. God don't care about your stuff. God cares about you and your eternal soul. I would hope we would all care about that too. So then how do we do that? How do we measure up Jesus' way? How do we measure our lives? Jesus and the apostles gave us some great advice. And for that, we turn now to the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus said this, Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, and thieves don't break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will also be. Have you ever asked yourself, because I'm sure you've read this passage before, I'm sure we've heard it here in church before, what did Jesus mean by store up for yourself treasures in heaven? What what does that practically look like? He's not necessarily talking only about tithing, offering, giving to the church to support the mission of the church. That might be a small part of it, but it's not the whole. Jesus here is really talking about a holiness of character. An obedience to God's call in each and every one of our lives. Winning souls for Christ. Growing in your faith deeper and deeper every week, every day. It really means using all that God has given you, all of what God has given you for His glory and not your own. But in that it also means not cheating God nor God's mission, or shortchanging God's church here on earth with the treasures that God has given to you and put in your pocketbook. We heard earlier what the Apostle Paul said to the church. I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, as for you who are rich, and that's all of us, right? Don't be snooty. Don't try to keep getting more and more and more stuff or even hope for that. Instead, set your hope on God who richly provides everything for us to enjoy. And then added to that, he said, do good. Be about doing good. Be rich in works and generous and ready to share when God's given you. Thus, store up for yourself treasures as a good foundation for a future so that you may take a hold of that which is true life. Let's make it practical. Right? This is all for not, just a theology lesson if we don't try to make it real and try to better our lives, right? How do we do that? Honestly, the best cure for any kind of greed is generosity. So if you're not serving God in His mission, and if you're not serving God's church, and you're watching as the 20% do 80% of the work because that's the national statistic. Then start tithing your time. Typical American works 40, 50 hours a week. Start serving. Give an hour or two of your time to the church or to nonprofit activities. Work your way up to four hours a week of serving and giving your time to those who are in need, the poor, the hopeless, the helpless even to the church. How are you measuring up? Would be my question to you. And if you're not giving back to God, I mean, right, the wallet, mine's in my office, but then search your heart. Statistically, nationwide, 
Some of us are generous and some of us are greedy. Statistically, 80% of all churches giving is given by 20% of the congregation. How are you measuring up? And if you're holding back your witness for Christ, then start sharing your God stories. You don't have to go out there with a track from Romans and thump someone on the head. You don't have to take your Bible and, you know, hit someone over the head. Those don't work anyway. There ain't no Monty Python going on here. No. God wrote a story on your heart. He did something in your life that maybe someone needs to know that could affect. Maybe someone's gone through some stuff that you already went through and your witness, your sharing of what God has done in your life can affect the life of another person and bring them to Christ. I mean, heaven knows 100% of us could do a whole lot better for that. And heaven is wide open. There's a lot more room in heaven for all the ungodly people and people that don't know God on planet Earth. Let's end with this. We're going to land this plane quick. I want you to go home today and then just walk out the door and go, hmm, that was an okay sermon. Ah, go home, think about it. And ask yourself, self, how am I measuring up to Jesus' way? Weigh your heart. Is this light as a feather? What would your heavenly Father say? Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, some messages are just harder for us to hear as Americans, especially ones like this, because we have to examine ourselves, every single one of us, pastors included. And we have to ask ourselves, am I being greedy with the blessings that you've given me? Father God, open up all of our hearts. Get all that heaviness out Help us to be generous with all the blessings that you've given us here in this country and to share more, to give more. Because the best cure for greed is to have a generous heart. Help us to be more generous in 2024, to think about you more than we do about our own stuff. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.